Uh, Phil Levine, I'm the chair of the economics department, and I'd like to welcome, welcome you to uh, this year's Goldman Lecture. Before we proceed to the main event tonight, I want to sp spend a minute uh, letting you know, since we have a captive audience of an event that the economics department is going to be sponsoring coming up very soon, you've all seen this sitting up here for a while. Um, given the uncertainty that we face in the world these days, we figured it made sense to organize a panel discussion on the economic uh, crisis and how it's affecting the United States and the world, and uh, more specifically, um, Europe. Uh, this is something that we're going to be doing in October. We have it set up with two dates. Given the complexity of the issues, we figured it made sense to split it up into domestic issues and to international issues. Uh, we have the dates of October 13th and 17th set aside. Uh, they'll be both of them will be lunchtime events in the atrium in Pendleton East. We hope you will put those on your calendars and join us uh, in those events. I should also say, by the way, that this is mostly going to be uh, the, the panel discuss the panels will be uh, mostly economists from our department, but also a couple of political scientists, given the clear interaction that's taking place between politics and economic outcomes these days. Uh, let me turn my attention back to our main uh, event here tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Marshall. Uh, whose generous donation made this event possible. Uh, Marshall's been contributing to our department for over 50 years and continues to do so uh, through events like this today. Just to place a little bit of import, uh, just place some context on the importance of this lecture, I went back and looked at the speakers that we've had in this series over the past 19 years, and it's quite an illustrious list. So over that period, we have had three Nobel Prize winners, one Treasury Secretary, one Director of the Office of Management and Budget, one Chair of the Federal Reserve Board, and two Vice Chairs, three Chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors, three World Bank Chief Economists, three Directors of the Congressional Budget Office, two New York Times columnists, and five winners of something called the John Bates Clark Medal. That is awarded bian biennially to the economist under the age of 40 who is judged to have made the most significant contribution to economic thought and knowledge. So we've had five of those. That's quite a list. Marshall, you should be very proud of what you've created here. With tonight's speaker, it turns out we will need to update that list. Esther Duflo is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics at MIT. She also was a recent recipient of the John Bates Clark Medal. In addition to the large number of awards uh, and achievements she has received, probably her most public of those uh, was being listed in Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. She's a co-founder of JPAL, which is the Jamil Poverty Action Lab, uh, which is an organization that runs randomized controlled trials to evaluate policy policies designed to help uh, alleviate poverty in developing countries. Chris Udry, a well-known development economist at Yale, has said about Esther that, quote, she exemplifies and has played a vital role in the exciting renaissance of development ec economics over the past decade. We are thrilled to have Esther here to speak to us tonight about her new book, Poor Economics, A Radical Rethinking of the Way to Fight Global Poverty. Esther? Thank you very much. I think I can be out. Great. Um, up for economics. Um, thank you. First, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marshall, uh, Mrs. President, for inviting me here. Also, the students who are uh, some of whom have been in my class have been a great pleasure to, pleasure to teach, and I think you uh, have one reason why it's uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, what I want to talk about uh, today is based on, on, on this book that uh, Abhijit Banerjee, my colleague at, at MIT, and I published last year. Uh, a few things uh, that you may or may not know about how the poor live their life on a day-to-day -day basis in, in poor countries. So it's not going to be like a, a summary of the book, and it's not going to have a big thesis, so you're not going to come out of here with maybe an action plan, but more a few things that uh, you know, might uh, intrigue you, hopefully, hopefully bring, uh, lead you to, to think further. 
So this is not going to be a big, uh, uh, a big theory. That's a little bit in contrast with the type of talk that you might have had from some of the voices that are most frequently heard today on uh, poverty in the world. So on the one hand, you have uh, Jeff Sachs, who uh, thinks that one, possibi one possible way to get out of poverty is to spend more money. Um, he has a view of how this money should be spent, and uh, his idea is that if only we did what he thinks work, or what he thinks are based on, on a body of scientific knowledge would work, it would really be possible to eradicate poverty by 2015. Um, and if we fail to do that, this is uh, a sign of a, a catastrophic moral failure of the West, not a sign that it's really a difficult problem. And on the other hand, we have people like uh, Bill Easterly or like uh, Dambisa Moyo who uh, argue that no, in fact, that's not the way it is. Aid is not the solution. In fact, it's often part of the problem. Uh, aid creates uh, rents over which people are fighting. Aid uh, usually comes with technical prescription that prevent uh, people uh, to find out what really would work for themselves. And the solution is really to encourage the development of a free market for ideas, that's democracy, and also a free market for capital and movement, that's capitalism. All of these things combined would really is the way to get out of poverty and not aid. So of course these two views are quite uh, radically opposed. And uh, it's not particularly surprising that the public discourse has been for a long time dominated by these kind of views. Because uh, poverty, in particular world poverty, is a problem that is both pressing and morally uh, very troubling. Uh, if you s uh, remember, for example, what happened not very long ago, what is still happening in the Horn of Africa, really have in mind something that is quite unacceptable, that most of the time we try not to think about it, but if we start thinking about it, we think, well, there should be a solution. Now, soon, we can't just let people live this kind of lives or die this kind of death. We, really would, we need to solve this entire problem at once. Hence, the strong demand for this kind of all or nothing solution. But unfortunately, the all or nothing solution has the problem of not being very uh, helpful for thinking. Usually, it clouds thinking because few things of the nature of all of nothing. And in particular, certainly not a thing like poverty, which is not just not having money, or it's not just a lower life expectancy, it's really a combination and a, a set of problems that go range from poor education to poor health to poor access to, uh, to finance or ways of, of realizing your projects. All of these things constitute poverty, so it's not really one thing. So it's very difficult to think that there would be one thing that then would be able to address this problem. So trying to take like a very big hammer to, 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 to look at this one problem really uh, fails. The other problem, the other reason why uh, it's a little problematic as a way to see things is that it's slightly discouraging. Because even though we have this demand for a solution, it's going to be an all and or nothing solution, I think at the, in, at the bottom of ourselves, we know that there really are no such solutions. And therefore, when things appear to be this very big problem that require this very big solution, if you don't fully believe it, you might just kind of tune out, check out, stop thinking about it. And here's one uh, experiment that uh, I think addresses this issue. Uh, so here's a... Um, Here's an experiment that uh, was conducted in, the, in Wharton, in the cafeteria of Wharton, by uh, um, a psychologist led by a psychologist called uh, Paul Slovic and a psychologist who does mainly economic, uh, called uh, George Lowenstein. And what they did is that they went to, uh, uh, to the students who were having their lunch, and they, uh, they selected some student randomly, and they asked them, uh, they, they showed them a flyer telling, here like there are a million people dying in Angola, and there are a million people dying from 
uh, some other problem in Zambia. Can you please help save the children who is going to uh, try and do something about it? And then to some other student, they presented a picture of a girl like this. Um, and they said, this is Rokia. That was not exactly her, but some, some other version of her. This is Rokia. She's seven year old from Mali, and she's at risk of dropping out of school uh, because her parents don't have money. Will you do something to, to help her? And uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, who do you think is a better fundraiser? The million people dying in Zambia or the little Rokia? The little Rokia. Uh, the million people dying in Angola are raising $1.16 per student. Rokia does better, not, it's not going to go f quite far yet, but she does better at $2.83 per student. So then the researchers went further and they said, well, Maybe we can try to have people think about this and we, maybe we can erase this bias by having people be reflective about this tendency we have to be like, attracted by one particular example of misery as opposed to the entire problem. So they went to another set of students and they first explained to them what I just explained to you, that you know, we have this tendency and in previous experiments we've seen that people tend to be like, focusing on particular uh, problems. And then they showed them the poster about Angola, and then they showed them to some people, and some people received Rokia. So did you think that, that erased the bias to do that? Or did you think the bias persist? So let's take a vote for, the, uh, did that erase the bias? So everybody has to vote, so you have to think of, <laughs> did that erase the bias? Uh, or did the bias persist? Normally, I should see many, many hands. So good, good for the contrary, and that did erase the bias, actually. But in a slightly uh, <laughs> counterproductive way, which is uh, the, the, the million starving in Angola didn't raise any more. And Milwan, the poor Rokia, still raised $1.36. So I think what happened is that people indeed saw this and started thinking twice. Their first instinct is, when we see misery in the world, we don't want to help, we want to be generous. And then we think twice, and we think, this is just such a too big problem, and my contribution is a drop in the bucket, and the bucket probably leaks anywhere. So there really is no point. And what you do by telling people that we have these tendencies, that you make them aware of the fact that, yes, that's going to happen. So what we want to do in a lot of our work, on the one hand, is try to figure out what works, what doesn't work to help poor people, but maybe also at some level, and especially with writing this book, is try to make people erase the bias the other way. And the way we want to make people erase the bias the other way is to make them believe that at some level, the problem of the starving million it's not all that different from the, from the problem that you can one by one solve. It's not the problem of one by one person, but it's a problem of one by one issue. How are you going to get them into school? How are you going to get the schools to actually teach them something? How are you going to make sure that every kid gets immunized? That kind of issues, which are problems, which are concrete problems to which we can apply our mind and which we can actually solve. So that's kind of what we are trying to to do, or what I'm trying to do in most of my work, and uh, that we are trying to illustrate with, with the way this book is written. And what I'm going to do today is, instead of kind of walking you through uh, um, elaborate theories in the book, is just take some little pieces here and there of exactly these things, like concrete issues, concrete problems that we can think through, and are telling us also something maybe a little more general how people live. And the first one, uh, which may be surprising to you, is that sometimes you can save money by paying people. Uh, so what, what does that come from? So, and why is it important? Well, it's important because a lot of NGOs, but also policymakers, are really enamored with the idea of sustainable programs. So not sustainable in the sense of being good to the planet, but sustainable in the sense that the program should be able to self-finance. So for example, you shouldn't give away things, you should sell them. 
because otherwise, how will the program sell finance? So as an economist who took public finance, it is something which is sometimes a little bit surprising because we know that there are things that uh, we should be willing to subsidize. And immunization is a clear example of that. Because once I get immunized, it's not only good for me, but it's also good for you. And therefore, I don't benefit from the full social value of my immunization. I share it with the rest of society, and hence society should be willing to subsidize me to get immunized. That's, of course, particularly true in a country like the US, where probably the private cost of being immunized is larger than the private benefit, because if you don't get immunized, you still won't get sick uh, against measles or something like that, maybe not the flu, uh, because so many people are already immunized. But even in a country like India, if I immunize my kid against measles, it's not only my benefits, it's others' benefits as well. So for this reason, the international community has been spending a lot of money and a lot of energy trying to uh, get people to get immunized. So the Gavi Alliance and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in particular, but also the WHO and many countries are putting a lot of energy in making vaccines available for free, trying to make sure that they, are, they arrive, there is a cold chain, etc. And yet, despite that, something like 20 million children every year are not getting the, uh, the, the basic immunization that they should be getting. So, why is that? So, that's kind of what you call a, a last mile problem. Uh, the infrastructure is there, the money is largely there, and yet somehow something doesn't happen. So, what's this last mile problem? So, here's one example of uh, of a region where we have a pretty big last mile problem. That's uh, Udaipur district in, in Rajasthan. Uh, it's a very nice place to do tourism, it's very beautiful. But uh, in, in that place, when we started working there, only 1% of children were fully immunized. That is, they received the five shots that are the basic package of immunization. And we were working with an NGO there called Seva Mandir, trying to figure out what the issue uh, might be. So one first thing you say maybe they don't really you know they are fatalistic you know culture. Even though people are not immunized, they consume enormous amount of healthcare. In fact, they're spending seven percent of their budget on healthcare. So what you have is these empty village subcenters and uh, crowded hospitals. So the same kid who is not immunized for measles, their parents will spend an enormous amount of money trying to cure the kid when she actually contracts measles. So that's not that. So maybe it's a problem of information. Maybe people don't understand the value of immunization. They wouldn't be alone. In the US, people don't understand the value of immunization very well. Uh, there is still, to these days, debates about whether it's linked to autism or this and that. Here's one, uh, something from the, from the New York Times talking about 300 people diagnosed with mumps in suburban uh, New York because they refused to get immunized. Uh, so things keep coming back. Uh, people don't really buy the immunization idea. So that's possible. Persuasion is difficult, especially something like immunization, which requires people to uh, uh, understand that you do something in order to avoid something which is not our natural sense of causality in a day-to-day -day life, where we do something so that something happens. So uh, immunization is harder to understand. Even once you understand, you need to go from intention to action. Uh, so you need to, what if you decided that you're going to do the immunization, you actually need to do it. And in Udaipo, if you try to immunize your kids, usually what you're going to find is this. That's a subcenter where the nurse is supposed to come and immunize your kid, but more often they're not disclosed. This particular one has been closed every week that we actually went to the village to, take the pic to, to visit it for a whole year. But many, the typical one is only closed about half the time, but you'll never know when. So eventually that becomes a little bit painful, so that will give you uh, encourage our natural human tendency to procrastinate. So we were interested in trying to figure out whether making it easier to, uh, to be immunized and perhaps making it even easier by as adding a small incentive to act today as opposed to wait till later 
would bring, uh, would increase the immunization rate. So we set up an experiment. So at uh, uh, GEPAL, what we do is setting up randomized experiments, which are similar to the type of experiments you'd, you would use to test a medicine, but to test a program. So this is what they pull viewed from the sky. We picked uh, villages randomly. So you can see they're all spread around the, the map because they're randomly selected. Half of these 120 villages were just left business as usual. People still try to get their kids immunized in the camp. Um, a th um, then a quarter are the blue villages where our partner Sevamandir set up immunization camps. So uh, they took the, the vaccines from the government and their nurse actually immunized everybody who came for free right there in the village. And the last force is the red villages. Is in addition from this uh, camp, people were offered a kilo of lentils for each immunization. So a kilo of lentil is really not very much. Uh, it's a few cents. It's not going to convince someone who is very much against immunization, but it's really going to convince someone who thinks they want to do it anywhere, but has a tendency to postpone till next month and again and again to actually act today. So here's what we found. Uh, this was the differences at baseline. So you see there are very, very, very few differences because the villages were randomly selected. So they're all the same. And the immunization rate was very low. At end line, after about two years, full immunization rates were 6% in the control group, something had improved. 17% when the camps were provided and 38% when we added the lentils. So you provide regular immunization and you add a kilo of lentils, you can really multiply the immunization rate by a factor of um, almost seven. So that's very encouraging, but then you could think, well, very nice, but how can we, enforce, how can we afford the lentils? It's not sustainable to provide lentils. Of course, we can give immunization for free, but we can't provide lentils in addition. And here is where uh, what I was saying uh, at the beginning comes in, which is actually when you do that, you save money. The cost of full immunization turned out to be $50 in the camp without incentive, and only 27% when the incentives were added. 27 is a very nice number because it happens to be the money that Gavi will give the government for every fully immunized kid. So why is it cheaper? to give incentive uh, than not to give incentive? Well, it's because regardless, you have to pay your nurse to immunize the kids. So the more she works, the more you, the, her time is valuable to you. And they ended up working much more in the camp with incentive because not only the immunization rate went up in the places where, in the villages itself, where, where the lentil were given, but uh, people also came from neighboring villages. So they worked significantly more, and therefore uh, their time was more valuable, and the price went down. So this is one of very, very many examples where the cost-benefit analysis that we are doing in our head, intuitively, is wrong. And there is no way to get it right unless you spend the time to actually analyze what happens if you went through the trouble of providing the incentive and looking at the effect which is why it's important to do that in detail, and not just talking about what might be the case. Because if you just talk about what might be the case, you're thinking, yes, of course, incentives should increase immunization rates, but you never know by how much, and therefore you can't do this calculation. Here is another perhaps surprising, uh, it's less a fact than a statement, uh, which is that television is more important than food. Uh, so what is... Uh, what is that about? Well, it's certainly not what my view of, uh, of, of poverty was when I grew up. I was born in 1972. So I was you know, getting, becoming like a, a teenager during a crisis which is not all that different from the crisis in the Horn of Africa today. Huge famine in Ethiopia, partly due to drought, partly due to war. Except that there was not, uh, like the whole world system was not collapsing at the same time, so people actually cared. <laughs> and 
and you had this like concert. You must remember the Michael Jackson "We Are the World," and um, and we were singing "We Are the World," and we were very committed. As far as I, for me, my first really memory of being engaged in the world, you know, as a as a citizen. So my view at the time was very strongly: being poor is being hungry. And I was not alone. This is a very strong uh, um, intuition that we have, very strong sense that a poor person is someone with a, a little African kid with a distended belly. It's not only our views, but it also informs policy making. A lot of money to fight poverty is being spent on food aid, to spend, transport food from the US to places where people might be hungry or to spend, transport food in India from some places in India to other places. If you took all of the bags of food that are in warehouses in India to help feed the poor, you could go all the way to the moon and then come back again. So that's how much uh, uh, bags of rice are, are around in India. A lot of it gets lost, eaten by rats, stolen around. It's like a terrible way of really helping people to lug this kind of food, unless you think that the key problem of the poor is that they are starving. So now, if the key problem of the poor is that they are starving, then what we should see is when people become a little less poor, they should eat more. They should really eat more and more because they were starving and finally they can get out of this starvation trap. So we can look at India, where the poor over time became less and less poor uh, over the last few decades, there are fewer people living under a dollar a day. But in fact, there are more people who are consuming less than the 2,400 calories a day, which are sort of a, a minimum for someone who is engaged in physical uh, work in rural areas. You can see that it went up from about 66% in 1983 to uh, almost 80% today. And this is not, not today, 2004. And that's an important number because this is not because the food prices were uh, going up at that time. The food prices have started to go up, but from 2005. And the real increase in the number of people not eating enough is from before. And the number of calories eaten by people has kept going down. The only nutrient that has really gone up in the Indian diet on average is fat. So are people complaining about this situation? They're not. They seem to be. In fact, uh, fewer and fewer people are reporting lack of food. So what is uh, happening? People uh, have a bit more money. They spend it on other things than food. And they don't seem to be all that sad about it. So that must mean they weren't starving. They weren't feeling like they were starving. So another way to see that is a very interesting experiment in China, which was run by uh, Rob Jensen, where they went out and try to make food cheaper. So it's an interesting experiment because as economists we like to see what happens when the price of things go down. Also because it's really close to uh, what policy tries to do, what anti-poverty uh, um, anti -poverty policy tries to do, tries to make cheap, fo cheap food available to people. That's why there is all this rice floating around India, is to try to make cheap rice available to people. So the distributed voucher uh, two poor uh, Chinese people for rice in some region and for wheat in some region where the wheat was the, uh, the staple. So when the price of rice went down by 10%, what's your estimate by how much the consumption of rice should be going, d uh, should be going down or up, whatever? Up by how much, roughly? What's your view of what should the elasticity of rice be? Ballpark. Okay, is it more than uh, is it more than a ten percent elasticity? More or less? More, less. Is it about zero? About zero. You're not bad, but it's, it's actually uh, negative. Uh, when the rice price went down by 10%, rice consumption dropped by 2.3%. That's a big winner because that means rice is a given good. 
There are not very many different goods. We like to see one when we when we uh, when we see it. So that's uh, that that was that was a uh, that was uh, a success. Uh, and in addition, it's really important. It's a really important finding because it's not just some random little good that you find. It's rice in a place where rice is a staple. So this is important. This is an important finding. And what makes it particularly important is that the reason why rice is a given good is because it is a staple. It's because it's such an important part in the budget of people that, to use the, uh, uh, the economist jargon for a second, the income effect is large enough to dominate the price, the substitution effect. So what happened is that I give you some, uh, the price is cheaper, I make you a little bit richer, Suddenly, you don't feel like you have your back to the wall anymore. And you can start thinking, well, I'm not going to eat only rice. I'm also going to eat some shrimps and some meat. Or I'm going to buy some cell phone minutes or something like that I want to do with my budget. On the other hand, of course, the rice has become cheaper. That makes rice attractive, but that doesn't compensate. So the reason is that can only be true because uh, food is relatively unattractive. So if people were feeling that they are starving, you wouldn't find that. It's because people are not particularly starving, but are spending so much money on food that, uh, that you get this kind of effect. So does it tell us that we don't have to worry about food whatsoever? Not at all, because there's still a problem. In India, people are still eating less than 2,400 calories a day. That's not enough. And not only that, the nutrient com uh, composition of these calories is not good. People are not getting enough iron, people are not getting enough vitamins, uh, and all of this impact on kids' ability to learn, adults' ability to uh, operate in the world, etc. So there is not, it's not that there is no food problem, but it's, not a, it's a nutrition problem. It is not a hunger problem. That means, as policymakers, it needs to be addressed with the, having the idea in mind that it's a nutrition problem. It's partly due to Education, it's partly due to an understanding of what these micronutrients do to you. It's partly due to the food habits and to other things people want to do. And if we want to address the nutrition problem, we need to address it in a completely different way than if we're thinking that what we need is to provide calories to people and what people want is calories. Here we need to be a bit more tricky. We're going to need to find ways in particular to pack nutrition into the food that people like to eat. So add iron in salt, uh, sprinkle kids, uh, you know, candies with uh, micronutrients, that kind of thing. So it shows again that it's very important to understand the economics or the behavior behind things before we try to design policies. Here is another one, which might not be all that surprising to you, uh, but is surprising to me, maybe just because I am French which is the idea that tracking is good for everyone. By tracking, I mean separating people by ability. So this, this the reason why you're surprising in France, you could lose your citizenship to say that you should do such a thing. Because we do it, but we don't like to say it. <laughs> so why is tracking good for everyone? So education, in a sense, is a story of success. Over the last few decades, enrollment rate have gone up. They've gone up faster for girls than for boys. Almost everybody starts at least primary school, a lot of people complete. Um, and yet, there is a reason not to rejoice, uh, which is that not much seems to be happening in those schools. 40% of uh, children in grade two to five can read a very simple paragraph that they should be able to master in grade one. Uh, in case you were wondering about mathematics, 30% of them can do a simple division. Again, the type of division that you should be able to do at the end of grade one. So there could be a number of explanations for this uh, phenomenon, a number of things you could do. You could try to pay for school uniform, you could eliminate fee, you could provide e-book readers, you could make the school, the, the classroom smaller, etc. And one thing you could do that might be a slightly not, that might seem like common sense, is to say, well, how about trying to teach kids what they don't know, but just at the level at which they can know? That may seem a bit like kind of mundane, like pretty obvious. 
but it runs into an issue, uh, which is an issue like that. This is a small class in Morocco. Uh, in a lot of developing countries, classes are much, much bigger, but this is a very isolated place in Morocco. So what do you see in this? What is surprising in this picture with that class? What's wrong with that class? They are very different ages. And this is, that's pretty typical. This is small class, that's not typical, but what is typical is how different people, children are from each other, how heterogeneous are. They are heterogeneous in age, they're also heterogeneous in the level of preparation with which they come to class. Some of whom are first generation learners, their parents can't read, some of whom, some of them have gone to preschool, some of them have not gone to preschool, etc., etc. And everybody is in one big class. And then the teacher is trying to teach to this. And uh, the, that, of, co of course, creates problems, because where, where are you targeting your teaching? To the best student, to the worst student, to the middle? You know you won't be able to uh, uh, touch everybody. So we tried something in Kenya where we, um, uh, the World Bank was paying the, uh, the salary of an extra teacher to cut the class size in grade one and two. Uh, so you could either decide that we are going to create two classes randomly, so we're going to have two classes which are similar but of very heterogeneous level, or you could try to cut the class in two by previous level, previous achievement. So you're going to have a good class and a less good class, uh, but those classes are going to be more homogeneous. And the presumption is that that's obviously going to be good for the good students going to find between themselves met better attention of the teachers, all that great. The problem is whether it's going to be good for the not so good students. Because now they've lost their good comrades who might be teaching them interesting stuff and they find themselves in between them. Maybe that's actually bad for them. So we did this experiment and what we did find, so this is we did that in some classes were divided randomly some classes were divided by abilities, those are the tracking class. And you can see the difference. So the high achievement kids, of course, do better than the low achievement kids, but they do even better in the tracking school than in non-tracking school. Now, what is more surprising is that even for the low achievement kids, they do better in the tracking school than in non-tracking school. So that is a surprising fact, that tracking is good for everyone. And why is that the case in this context? It's the case in this context because in Kenya, like elsewhere, just when teachers are facing this problem of who am I going to teach to, their decision is to teach to the top, to the very best student in the class. Because all the reward in the Kenyan school system and in the Indian school system and in the Ghanaian school system and in many countries which have a colonial origin are uh, about teaching the best students, partly because the system is inherited from a, a system which was about creating a small elite of educated intelligentsia among the uh, local people, partly because even today, this sort of the demand of the parent who think that education is very nice, but it's kind of useless unless uh, you see it as a lottery ticket to get a government job. And the only way in which it's a good lottery ticket for a government job is if you actually manage to go to secondary school. But a lot of these kids in grade one are not going to make it to secondary school. If they are not managing in the first semester of grade one, they're not likely to make it to secondary school. So no one really cares hugely about how well they're doing. And that's why all of the emphasis is to the top. And the poor students at the bottom get no instruction whatsoever. Now, when I cut the class by ability, there is no top anymore. So the teaching level has gone back to much closer to where the students can actually follow, which is why it's a good thing for them. So here again, it's saying, well, that doesn't mean tracking is the only policy you could do. But any policy that is going to be about trying to reteach the students at their level is going to have huge reward. Could be computer assisted learning, could be remedial education, it could be extra classes, summer camps, etc., for students who are lagging behind or tracking. So let's go back to this thing that parents think that the best thing possible is uh, uh, about education is that it's a lottery ticket uh, for uh, for a government job. 
Um, uh, that might be a bit surprising because if you follow, say, Mohamed Yunus, you will every person is an entrepreneur and someone who is very interested in their own business. So why would they want their kids to not do the same? Indeed, it is the case that a lot of the poor are entrepreneurs, much more than in the rich world. 50% uh, of the poor, of the urban poor, in 18 countries where we looked at the data, operate a small business. And in a rural area, many people have a farm. But in addition, even 20% also have a non-farm businesses. So in the rural area, almost everybody is trying to run a business or another. So in that sense, the poor are really, all, like many, many of the poor are indeed entrepreneurs in the sense of being fully residual claimant of the risks of their activity. But is it something that they aspire to? It doesn't really look like. Uh, this is uh, from Udaipur, the same place where we did the immunization work. Parents' employment for hopes for their son. 18% of them wants to be, want them to be a private firm employee. 41% of them want them to have a government job, non-teaching, and 34% of them would like to be a them to be a government teacher. So, nobody mentioned them that they want to be an entrepreneur. So, what is striking is that these people who are all, who, many of whom are entrepreneurs themselves, what they're really yearning for their, for their children is stability. It's the kind of the opposite of what they have. So they're running the shop, they're running the business, but not hugely invested in it. So now you might, want, you, want, you might wonder, well, if they so much would like their kids to be working in a, in a farm, why aren't they working in a farm? Why are they running their own business? Well, they're not working in a farm because they can't find a job. So the issue is that, then why can't they find a job? Like, why aren't they, if there is so many people who would like this kind of job, why doesn't someone set up a factory? Why is it the case that everybody has to start a small, small, small uh, shop next to another small, small shop next to another one next to another one when there could be one supermarket that employs all of these people? And here is one way to, to think about it. And one way that we think is the key problem. This is a production function which relates how much you can produce with how much money you've invested in your business. So at zero, at the beginning you have very, very little. So at the beginning, any money that you put in the business is going to really be super productive. So the return are high at the beginning. But then they slowly, it's pretty swiftly decline. Say when you have enough goods to fill you one room, if you really wanted to start inc increasing your business, you would need to start getting another room and getting an employee and all that. So you would need to really jump in the kind of investment that you're making to really do better. In your one room, if you continue, it's really going to be like uh, flattening up. Or think about the sewing machine. With sewing machines, you can do some, some sewing, but if you really want to get into a shop factory, you need like a much bigger investment, so something like this OQ investment. And once you're making OQ investment, at the beginning you're really losing money because your, your returns are lower than what you've put in it. So you need to, if you're going to invest in Q, you really need to go all the way to R to make it worthwhile. So there is this big hole in the middle, which is very, very hard to jump over. It's like a, you can either start with very small businesses or you can start with much bigger businesses. In the middle, there is really no scope for medium form. Because the medium form is going to be kind of in between the two stools, not very comfortable. And the issue is that if the credit market doesn't work very well, the capital market doesn't work very well, there are not enough firms that are at the, at the large level to people who would like to work there and who are there have to run this small business is really of trying to grow the business because after some point it's just not worth it. So the reason why people aren't wanting to be entrepreneurs is just too hard. You can work and work and work and work and if you really work very hard you're going to get point M. You're still going to be pretty poor. 
Another reason why people don't really like to be entrepreneurs and why they want their kids to have government jobs is because of the risk. Is that not only you never become really very rich running a small business, running a small shop, but in addition, your income actually fluctuates a lot. You suffer from droughts, like what is happening today in Africa. You suffer from the fluctuation in the, in the price in the world market. You suffer from uh, fluctuation in the price of your inputs, etc., etc. And the risk is costly both when it hits you, because you're not properly insured it, but even ex ante, it's also costly. Because suppose take these people, for example, they grow, they grow maize. And they grow, they have a nice uh, field, but they grow traditional maize. They don't hybrid maize. And one reason why they don't grow maize is because hybrid maize is quite risky. Because if you do hybrid maize and it doesn't work, you've actually paid for the input, and if it doesn't work, you've lost your money, and often it won't work. The rain is not at the right time, etc., and you have no insurance for that. So the risk not only hurts people when it hits, but it hurts people in advance because it prevents them to actually do things that would uh, uh, be more productive on average because there is no way to edge the bets. So given that you wonder, you know, where are the insurance companies for the poor? It seems that it's something where they would you really make a, a killing, you know, a definitely a sustainable enterprise. Uh, in fact, the next billion dollar market opportunity was a quote from Forbes magazine who uh, uh, suggested that this could be it. You could sell at least simple insurance product, like a weather insurance product, which doesn't depend on anything very complicated, it just depends on whether it has rained. So if it has not rained enough, you pay some, some money. If it has rained enough, you don't pay. You don't need to check the condition in the field. It's very simple to administer. You could do that on a very large scale. You would think that this is something that should be very popular. And it turns out that actually very popular. And that's one reason why the insurance companies are not there for the poor. You know, the poor are not really raring to go. Here's one example. This is an experiment that Chris Udry and Dean Carlin conducted in Ghana. What they're doing is that they're offering farmers a weather insurance product, very much like the one I just described. It's going to pay you if uh, the insurance falls down. The uh, actually fair price, that is the price at which the, the risk exactly cover uh, the amount of money, is 9.5 Ghana CDs per acre. If you offer it for free, everybody wants it. It's encouraging. But as soon as you charge, start charging people, the, pr the demand really falls down. And at 9.5 CD is only about 40% wanted. And at 14 CD, which is what the insurance company would like to, to charge in order to make some administrative fee that they need to have, the demand is so low, 10%, it's really not worth it f setting up the company. So basically, there is just no demand for this product. So why is there no demand for this product? I think one reason why there is no demand for this product is that that's precisely too simple. This is a wonderful product. You don't need to verify what happened in the field. But it could be that uh, the condition of this guy is extremely dry. And it turns out that the rainfall in the weather station, which is not all that close, is just above the threshold. Then it's not going to be paid. So from the point of view of the poor people, this insurance policy that you can offer them, that's the only thing that the market can sustain because they won't be moral hazard, they won't be fraud, etc. Are these pro uh, pro programs that are full of holes. That are, so the way they see it is that you are proposing to me another lottery ticket on top of my already risky life. Now you can try to explain that yes, that's true, but it's a lottery ticket that's negatively correlated with your risk, so it's a good one. But unless you have some kind of amount of the brain already a little bit twisted by undergraduate economics, then you just don't buy that. And that's kind of why it's been um, difficult to sell insurance. Doesn't mean you can't sell insurance, but you probably need to subsidize it pretty widely. And there's probably a lot of value to that. So let me start wrapping up by talking a bit about political economy. 
Because a lot of times where I give like this kind of talk, so I'll talk about these issues, there's always someone to say, well, that's very nice, but uh, you ignore the real problem. The real elephant in the room is not these things. Yes, you could fix this and that. But at the end of the day, for governments to do anything, they first need to fix themselves. And that's really difficult. And you're not going to, because there is so much weight of history and uh, corruption and things like that, that is really the reason why people stay poor, is the governments are bad. And probably they are bad for reasons that are just impossible to change. The weight of history or bad geography or what have you. And what I want to finish to leave you, I want to leave you with the thought that sometimes it might be true, but sometimes the voice of the poor is ignored for not particularly strong reasons. They sometimes not do, not, not fail to see what the poor might need for the same silly reason that it was just poorly designed, some program was poorly designed. Let me give you one example from Brazil. It's from a paper by uh, uh, a student who in, <coughs> in Canada who just finished this year. So here's uh, um, what you used to encounter in Brazil if you wanted to vote. Uh, many of you are probably not, uh, not old enough, but some of you might recognize the famous butterfly ballot. Because the ballot has two sides. This is to vote for your préfet. This is you vote to, to vote for your uh, variador. So to vote for your préfeto, it's not too hard. You need to find who you want to vote for and tick the right box. To vote for your variador, it's a bit more complicated. You need to uh, find in another list, in another roster, the name of who you're looking for, find their number, and write it here without mistake. Now, in Brazil, a lot of adults are not literate. So that particular exercise turns out to be a little bit complicated. So here's what they did at some point, is they replaced this system by an electronic system. They, they replaced the system by an electronic system because they, they would make it faster to count the votes. Uh, they didn't have anything else in mind at the time. So now the system is simpler. You just need to, you, you, you still need to find the name of who you want to vote for and the number, but now you can punch it. So it's a bit easier than to write it. And the advantage is that once you punch it, you see the picture of you, you who you want to vote for. If it's not valid, it will appear as invalid. So it will really help you figuring out whether you're doing the right thing. So when they did it in Brazil, they first introduced it in the largest city. And then they introduced it in smaller cities. Uh, so we can compare what happened first in the largest city compared to other cities, and then as the smaller city joined the largest city. And what you find is that 11% uh, uh, more voters were enfranchised. That is, they, they, they had tried to vote before, but their vote was not counted because it was invalid. And only invalid vote went away. And of course, who are the invalid vote coming from? They were mostly coming from the poor. So they uh, elected different people. The representative with lower education got elected because they were representing the poor. And they adopted policies that were in favor of the poor. So in particular, more was spent on healthcare. And as a result, the birth rate improved among the poor as well as the uh, level of uh, antenatal care, the number of people who obtained problem that I talked about, sorry. A, a little machine that was meant to count the vote faster had this huge impact on real policy that are actually touching real people. That shows you ab ab how important the plumbing is. We tend to think about large issues, etc. That's all fine and important, but the plumbing is hugely important. And a lot of this, my work is about the plumbing. And what I want to leave you with here is the thought that the plumbing is also there in political economy. Political economy institutions, what is it at the end of the day? A set of rules. And these rules have enormous effects on the final outcomes. 
who get to vote, who get to speak, how this, the discourse is organized, all of that matters tremendously. So why does all of this matter? All of this matters because it is the case, I don't want to be falsely optimistic, that a lot of the programs and policies that we dream up in favor of the poor fail. And that's a bit depressing. But they don't fail because the problem is impossibly hard. They don't fail because of some big conspiracy against the poor that we haven't really looked at yet. They often fail out of what we call the three eye problem, which is a combination of ideology. Someone thinks of a program based on some preconception of what is the poor's problem. It would be my ideology, my ideology, your ideology, or someone else in the middle. Ignorance. Uh, this ide ideology are so strong that they don't need to uh, uh, be sustained by any knowledge of the field. And inertia. Oh, I've lost my, I've lost my side. An inertia, uh, which is that you see, like it's inert. An inertia, which is that the, and the. Uh, once a policy is in place, it becomes very difficult to undo. Once we, because there is a constituency that's behind this policy, someone is being hired to check the boxes, and therefore it's kind of, you can't really come back. And this combination is quite lethal. I'll give you one example, and then we'll stop here. Uh, in India, there is a... Um, uh, uh, they had this idea at some point that to, to improve the quality of education needed to get the poor to really participate in the uh, management of the schools. So that's the ideology, not necessarily a bad one, that you know, there needs to be voice, and voice is what makes uh, everything happen. So everywhere they decided to start village education committees. So what we did is we went to a, to a state, uh, Uttar Pradesh, the biggest state in India, and we started asking people about the village education committee. Only 8% of, of the parents knew about uh, the, the committees. Uh, only 2% knew what they were supposed to do. And 25% of the committee members had no idea that they were committee members. And this was the institution that was in every single village, on paper, nicely instituted, that was supposed to be the uh, voice of the poor in the education system in India. And when we went and talked to the, to the administration there, and we asked them about that, they said, well, no, no, it's very simple. We put the students of the best, the parent of the best student in the class, and the parent of the worst student in the class, and the parent of the handicapped class, that's the school committee. And we asked, well, but we have eliminated all exams in school, so how do you know who is the best student in the class? And then there was a lull in the conversation, and we stopped. They just had no, no one has ever checked to see whether the rules make sense, but it's being applied anyway. And that's kind of too often the way things are done. So why am I concluding with that? Well, because at some level, you could say, well, this is a bit depressing in all this waste. At some level, it's also kind of encouraging. Because it's, it's also waste that means that there are many, many, many dollar bills lying on the ground. Which really are up for grab if you are willing to put like a little bit of energy into finding out what they are. If you're willing to assume that it's not because something, someone hasn't done something yet that it's not doable. If you're willing to see, to think of things that people haven't yet thought about. And a lot of policy making is a little bit crippled by this kind of fatalism. That if it could be done, it would have been done. If it had not been done, it must be really, really hard. And what we see like day after day after day is that in fact that's not the way it is. Is that often you can make huge difference by really taking the time to understand. So I think that gives kind of each of us um, a bit of a role to play. At our level, it's kind of understanding. You know, it doesn't go, for you, it doesn't go much further than try to see, is there a way for me to understand the world a bit better? You know, going to a developing country is one way, but just sitting and reading book is another one. Is there a way for me to not take the latest, the latest fad about development as given? Is there a way for me to question these things? 
And all of these things is kind of slowly, slowly making things better. In a way that I think really could amount to tremendous difference, the type of thing you know, I've showed you here along the way. Thank you very much. I just have a question about one of the latest fads um, in development, which is microfinance. And I know that you've done uh, a lot of research and you've done an experiment demonstrating that it is not uh, very effective, at least in, in the specific cases where you've done the experiments. And I just wanted to ask, um, do you think that uh, there's a lot more experimentation and, and study that needs to be done on microfinance, or do you find that uh, I mean, I just kind of want to know where the current state of analysis is on it. And so what's very interesting about microcredit is that it's, um, it's really a double fad. Because first, there is a huge fad about microcredit is the best thing since sliced bread and it's going to solve all the problems in the world. But I was yesterday's fad. Today's fad, if you really want to be current, is microcredit is horrible and leads people to commit suicide. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the recent one. Uh, both of which are outrageous, like neither of these things are true. Uh, what we have found in the, in the studies we've done is microcredit actually has modest but real impact in helping people manage their very small business a tiny bit better. That doesn't turn them into uh, uh, Bill Gates just because a lot of people don't have it in their modern business to be Bill Gates. Uh, now, there is a lot to do about microcredit uh, and a lot of experimentation to do about mi microcredit, both in the field uh, from the part of the microfinance agencies and, and you know, in collaboration with researchers uh, as well. Because part of the reason that, part of what limits its, uh, its effectiveness uh, is in a sense what also has made it wonderfully successful, which is an extremely rigid, simple product which makes it easy to administer and cheap, but on the other hand, makes it hard, for example, to scale, um, and uh, makes it hard for people, makes it hard to adjust to some more flexible businesses, etc. doesn't really encourage risk taking. And so where there is really a tremendous amount, I think, of progress that could be made is to see, is it possible to invent products that retain the beautiful idea of microcredit, which is if you manage to make things simple, to reduce the administrative cost and make it available to the poor at rates that was really not much, much lower than what they would have otherwise. And at the same time, retain a little bit the, the informality of the money lender and things like that, which have flexibility, uh, which o o would make it even more useful. So I think there is a lot of work to be done. And uh, what is happening now in microcredit is like a pretty bad case of throwing the baby with the bad weather. And, um. Has any of your work um, ever evaluated the impact and the long-term cost effectiveness of improving access to health care? either in a general population or a specific population like women and children? So the issue becomes, in some sense, you have to go one step further, which is uh, or one step closer, which is how you're going to improve access. I think uh, improving access is almost indeniably a good thing. But where we run into, into trouble is how do we do that? Uh, and that has been, so some people are working on that, but so far I wouldn't say there is like a great body of evidence of what really uh, is important. Is in, in terms of preventive care, we know one thing which is a very important thing, which is price is extremely important. Like people are extremely sensitive to prices. I showed you an example with immunization where if you give a small incentive, everybody gets immunized, but it's true in the opposite direction, where if you charge for preventive care, people just stop getting it. So here it's a very key things. Uh, but there are, for example, a very important issue on which little progress has been made, is in, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa, is maternal mortality. And there is an issue of access to, to care where people just don't deliver in hospital. And there is not really a question of fees because it's free, people are really trying, so it's other things. And there is work on it, but it's ongoing, like there is not really a result yet, and that's a very important area of studies. 
Hi. Um, I study education here at Wellesley, and I know that a lot of people have very negative ideas about tracking, and we talked about that today. Um, but people believe a lot that tracking is very oppressive, and it holds a lot of students back from you know, achieving greater opportunities in this world because once you put somebody into a lower track, then they therefore fall behind than their classmates. So I was just wondering if the same kind of issues exist in the developing countries that we've talked about today and if tracking is actually an oppressive system there as well, even though you talked about it as being something that was very positive. So, First of all, I'll say one thing which is important, which is I really talked about tracking in the context of, of Kenya. Uh, I, I think similar results would be obtained in India. I don't really don't know about the US because uh, I gave you the theory of why tracking matters in, in a country like Kenya, and it's because uh, teaching is teaching to the top. But the opposite result would obtain if teaching is teaching to the bottom already. Then the students at the bottom would lose from losing their their, their, their friends, and there you would find tracking being bad for the bottom of the class. So whether or not tracking is good is going to depend on the the nature of the educational the educational system. Now, in a country like India, you we often get exactly the, uh, the kind of response you give us, like oh, you want a system for the rich and a system for the poor, and the truth is that's already the case. Except now, if you go to the system for the poor, not only you will never get out of the system, but you will not get anything out of it. You'll spend five years in school without learning how to read. So without solving at least that problem to start with, there's no foundation to do anything else. And that's why I think that's kind of where you want to start, is to say we need to be, you know, if the classes are so heterogeneous, we need to have a way to manage that. And since not teaching to the top is not really an option, at least separating the classes by what people know as opposed to what their official grade happens to be seems to be the right way to proceed. Hi. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the very inspiring talk tonight. Um, I was wondering, what is the first step you suggest each of us takes tomorrow as students um, to improve the situation? So I think there are a number of things you can do. Um, I think uh, maybe that's going to be a bit lame, but I will say it anyway. I think a very important thing you can do as a student and all your life is to keep your eyes open. I think students have, uh, you know, you have the great advantage of having enthusiasm, etc., and also like uh, your an open mind and time to really figure things out. So don't get sidetracked into one, like, uh, that's the way to do things. And uh, kind of take the time that you have now to try and understand something. That kind of catches your fancy, you know, if it's education, try to say, I'm really going to try and understand education, like the education problem in such and such country or in the world. Um, uh, or if it's about you're interested in finance, try to really understand uh, what has worked, what does not work in micro but don't get like trapped in a motu. So that's kind of one thing, like kind of understand, etc. And then I think, you know, I'd get out, <laughs> you know, go and see the world. There is poverty plenty in this country, so it's not even far to, uh, to see uh, and, and, and to do something. Uh, I think, you know, just be a big sister to a kid in the inner city, you learn a tremendous amount. If you can, if you have a chance to, to go to a developing country, that's kind of, maybe not tomorrow, but next summer or something, that's really something you can do. And um, that is purely personal, but I would say, you know, collect money, spend money. Uh, that's, that's, that can't hurt. There are organizations who are doing good work here, and I think we can also help them. I'd said that it was something like 37% of the villages that had the immunization plus the incentive 
um, that, that they had 37 percent of their children fully immunized. Yeah. But you also mentioned that people were walking from nearby villages. And I was wondering if it would be possible that the incentive would have even more of a positive effect than the numbers showed. Uh, yes, so uh, the, if you add the, the, the people walking from the nearby villages, like if you take within, a, a, um, within six kilometers, uh, the, and you exclude the own village, but six kilometer walk, it goes to, it's about 20% full immunization. So it, it, or 25%, so it drops down, but it's like from 37, but like up to a pretty large amount, people are, are, still, are still coming. Another way we also, another thing we also need to point out is that that's full immunization. That means having getting the five shots, but almost everybody gets the first one and the second one and the third one, and it really drops at the fourth and the fifth. And it's already pretty good to get the few, the first few one. It's the BCG and the first few shots of DPT. Just you're missing measles. So in that way also, it's kind of bigger than this 38 percent makes it look. Which doesn't mean that we shouldn't be worried about that remaining 60 percent. I should also say that we're continuing to track, and lately we've, we've gone to the same villages, and now it's really gone up, the full immunization rate has gone up in the treatment villages to about 67%. Because people kind of learn also that. Um, I, was, I have two questions. First, I was wondering if there's going to be a safety on the response of policymakers to your findings. And second, um, back to the tracking, I was wondering if the results have shown any kind of convergence or hope of convergence. Uh, so, on the first question, that's a, that's a really good question. That's uh, uh, what I like to say is like my day job is to try to identify what works, and my my night job is to is to try to convince policymakers that it works. It makes like for pretty long days. Uh, <laughs> So, um, I think that there is progress, actually. Uh, it's, it's, it's a slower, I mean, it, for me, it, it, you know, we, I'm trained as a, as, a, as a social scientist. I know how to set up experiments. I had to learn that, obviously, but wow. <laughs> Bedtime. No, uh, I know how to set up experiments. I uh, so it's kind of what I do. But, but convincing policymakers is kind of another kettle of fish a little bit, and we are learning as we go. But I think there is there is progress. The first thing that that uh, where we see progress, I think there is much more willingness now to evaluate programs. Uh, and the second thing is you do start seeing some examples, not a huge amount yet, but some successful example of people adopting adopting something that has worked and trying it out for themselves. For example, the tracking results, uh, this, there was work done in Kenya, there was work done in India, and now the government of Ghana is doing a huge experiment in Ghana. It's a randomized experiment, so it's not yet the full program, but it's a very big pilot of a program where youth from the youth service can work for two years. You're asking what you can do, teach for America, you can do. Um, can work from the youth service are going to go into the schools to teach the remedial classes for children. And if that works, they are going to adopt that as a national policy. So that's really like a very encouraging example that you, you, you can make progress. Good evening. Thanks so much for coming and speaking tonight. Um, so actually, in one of my classes this afternoon, we had been told about a program in Africa that would give parents a mosquito net um, for bringing their children in to be vaccinated, and that children were found to be dying, and it was found that the cause was that parents um, would bring children in repeatedly for immunizations in order to get mosquito nets to sell. And I was wondering, what is to keep parents from bringing children in for repeated immunizations if they can get lentils for it? Uh, so I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the, the, the anecdotes you're talking about. And I talk under the control of your president here. But I think you would have to be immunized many, many, many times to die of it. <laughs> so I have trouble believing that that's a real problem. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the rule is that when a child arrives, 
and you, they don't have an immunization record, so you don't know whether they've immunized or not, you should immunize. So there is a lot of things like that kind of circulates like that. Uh, in fact, uh, that, that program of bed nets for immunization, has the, the main result has been a dramatic fall in the prevalence of measles in 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 the in country like they did it I think in uh, in Ghana they did it in Kenya uh, where the because the the bed nets are uh, distributed measles immunization camps so I think that's the first order effect. Uh, often people will take one anecdote and kind of try to make some mosquito nets. Um, that's another thing where you were saying you should give them for free because if I sleep under mosquito net, even without the vaccine, just give them away because if I sleep under mosquito net, that that protects me, but that also pro protects you because the mosquito is not going to bite me if I already have malaria. So there was a very powerful argument for giving mosquito net for free. And then all sorts of anecdotes about, no, if you give them for free, people are going to use them as... A you know, to as fishing nets or as wedding veils or what have you. <laughs> and then in, in Dambisa Moyo's book, there is this whole like catastrophic story about some guy who was producing mosquito nets that people were buying and then they were given for free and he lost his job and then blah, blah, blah. And the truth is that if you, you can do an experiment of if I give the mosquito net for free, are people less likely to use it properly than if I ask people to pay for it? And this is really no different whatsoever. So you had these anecdotes and then they were kind of not really based on much. And But uh, before they were dispelled, and I think now the debate has really moved, but before they were dispelled, there was this very strong view that you shouldn't give away mosquito nets for free because people are going to waste them. So I think, yes, I'm not saying that what you're saying is not a possibility. But I think one would need to really look at is there, you know, how many cases do you have of people being uh, immunized more than once, several times, etc. You can you can do some spot checks, seeing whether that can and 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 then start to worry about it. See you on the 13th. <laughs>